Hello everyone, this is Eric Sweden with NASIO. We're going to start in about four minutes, about two minutes after we'll, we'll begin. I'll give you a little heads up about this particular webinar. Uh, we are going to go long, so uh, stay with us as long as you can. And uh, we will be distributing the slides as well as all the responses to all the questions after this, uh, this webinar. So stay tuned. We'll start in about three minutes. Hello everyone, Eric Sweden here with NASIO. We're going to start in about two minutes, so stay tuned. And uh, as I stated earlier, we are going to go long on this uh, webinar, which we will probably do on a lot of these data management webinars. So uh, all intended to help you. This is a uh, very practical, uh, I think it approaches training. Uh, so uh, please stay on as, as long as you can. We'll start in about two minutes. Thanks. We'll start in about a minute here. Peter, uh, since we are going to go long, what do you say we uh, maybe allocate uh, a maximum of 15 minutes for questions? Sure. Although, again, whatever you pull up on the chat, we'll try to address as well. So we don't get a yeah, chance we'll to address, address everything. We'll address everything eventually. But just for this this, this call, let's, let's maybe limit it. Whenever you and Mel, uh, Melanie and Jeff are done, then we'll, we'll go maximum 15 uh, just because we don't want to keep people too long. Um, well, that's, that means when I run out of nickels here at the payphone, Eric. Yeah, I don't know what we're going to do then. You know, we'll probably hear some <laughs> telephone operator say, sorry, your call is over. Now, when that's over, <laughs> I'm going to start presenting myself and uh, committing you to many kinds of things. So, Peter, this is dangerous giving this control back to you. <laughs> <laughs> As it always has been. As it Found always a payphone that accepts nickels? Yeah, really. <laughs> or a payphone entirely, right, Jeff? <laughs> yeah, I'll volunteer Peter to uh, consult for NASIO for free. Hey, Amy, what do you think about the recording button? Should we start? Uh, let's start now, okay? All set, Eric. All right, very good. So we're going to begin now. Thank you all very much for joining us uh, for this webinar, and uh, very happy to have you here. Um, this is Eric Sweden, Program Director, Enterprise Architecture and Governance, Nas National Association of State Chief Information Officers. This webinar is being sponsored by our NASIO Data Management Working Group. This is the third in our series on data management, and this series of webinars will present on such topics as data governance, data stewardship, the capability maturity model. Today is uh, kind of an introductory on that, Agile, uh, the impact on data management, and we'll have presentations from various state and local governments, CIOs, GIOs, CISOs, analytics groups. So stay tuned to NASIO for more information on future webinars. Today's webinar will describe the DMM, its evolution, and illustrate its use as a roadmap guiding organizational data management improvements. And we are serious about data management here. So this is a very useful webinar for us. Please use the chat box for questions. 
send to all participants so everyone can see what is being asked and we'll respond to as many questions as we can at the end of this webinar, but we'll also distribute a complete response to all questions that you submit as well as the slides from this presentation uh, over the next few days. So uh, any questions we don't address here, we will eventually address uh, via uh, text and uh, an email out to all registrants. So today <clears throat> we're talking with Dr. Peter Aiken, Melanie Mecca, and Jeff Walcove. And we're very happy to offer you a case study from the great state of Arizona. This is something we hadn't anticipated when we started uh, advertising this webinar, but just over the last uh, couple of, actually at last 24 hours, we were able to pull in a case study. So let me give you a little background on our guest speakers. Uh, Ms. Melanie Mecca is CMMI Institute's Director of Data Management Products and Services. She has been solving enterprise data challenges for over 30 years. She's a managing author, author of the Data Management Maturity Model, DMM, her team created a business-centric method for evaluating an organization's data capabilities, and she leads assessments for organizations in multiple industries. Dr. Peter Aiken has been a personal friend, friend of NASU for many years. He has presented before on our conferences, webinars, uh, conference calls. <clears throat> in 1999, he founded Data Blueprint Incorporated, a consulting firm that helps organizations leverage data for profit, improvement, competitive advantage, and operational efficiency. He is also Associate Professor of Information Systems at Virginia Commonwealth University, VCU, past President of International Data Management Association, DEMA, and Associate Director of the MIT International Society of Chief Data Officers. Mr. Jeff Walcove is a Data Governance Architect uh, in the Business Engineering Group for the State of Arizona. Jeff has been with the State of Arizona Strategic Enterprise Technology Office for nearly five years as a member of the Business Engineering and Enterprise Architecture Team. His primary role is to establish a statewide data management program for the State of Arizona. The program will improve interoperability, data quality, data sharing, and support a data-driven culture across more than 100 state agencies. Prior to this, Jeff worked as Director of Information Systems and Director of Production Support Data Integration at a number of healthcare companies. He is a chartered professional accountant. Thank you, Peter, Melanie, Jeff, for presenting to us today. We also have Amy Glasscock on our staff providing expert assistance with our web tool. And thank you, Amy. Everyone, thanks very much. Peter, I'm turning it over to you. Eric, thank you very much. And uh, when you mentioned that you wanted to have a talk on maturity, uh, it, it actually leads us to a good place to start, which is that Jeff's previous profession before he got into data as a CPA is one that we actually have 8,000 years worth of history in. And uh, uh, just a quick little story, but when my wife and I were getting together and we're sort of figuring out what we did, she said, oh, so you data people haven't figured out what a general ledger is yet. And I thought, well, there's a pretty interesting piece of insight into that process. And I looked into it to say, you know, why is that the case? And we've been doing this for about 150 years total, whereas the accountants literally have 8,000 years, eight millennia, if you will, of history uh, in terms of how this works. So, uh, Jeff, your perspective is going to be very welcome here. And again, feel free to chime in at each and any piece. Uh, when you did say that you wanted to talk about maturity, though, I said, well, I have to get Melanie involved in this because, first of all, she's the primary author, but she's also as passionate about this as Jeff and I are. And so uh, look forward to your comments on this. It's really all about trying to achieve what best practices are. And I, I have to start out at the beginning of this and say to everybody, every company that comes in to talk to you all, including your own internal people, are going to have a starting place, which is what do we have currently? Well, the problem is, if everybody's doing their own different one, we have no ability to create standards and best practices. And that's really what the intent is here, is to look at this. So what we're going to do today is talk about uh, a little bit about motivation and are we satisfied with the current performance of data. And, and the answer for most of us is no, we, we can do better uh, on this. So then how do we get here, which is the research path that got us to this particular piece. 
and we'll move through those phases very quickly. Uh, if you have questions, let us know. But of course, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. But what you really want to hear is, what is the data management maturity model? And at that point, we're going to dive into some very good material. We've been using these these models for over 20 years, and they are very effective. Most importantly, as you'll see later on, they're also the only ones that have any basis in scientific results, and that's hugely important. Then we'll get to the part that I know a lot of you are wanting to hear, which is Jeff talking about how he is going to do this to solve all of the data problems in the state of Arizona. There, Jeff, you're on the record now for that, right? I'm kidding. It's a long task, and it will be a lot uh, to do, but he's well situated in order to do that. So Melanie, did you want to jump right in here and, uh, and start away? I can. So we're going to mm -hmm. be looking at this diagram again in a few minutes. But essentially, the, what we did was to take the fundamental data management practices, which you can parse out in excruciating detail, as many of you are aware. And we put them into five primary buckets. So uh, the first bucket is data management strategy. And that is essentially, it represents an answer to the problem of all of our industries in that we have not considered data as a program or even above that as a lifestyle, a cultural lifestyle in the organization. It's been addressed project by project, um, data store by data store for so many years. So strategy, there are five key process areas within the data management strategy that help you plan what you're going to do, assess where you are, and have a very good vision step-by-step step for the future of the data assets. Uh, governance is not only about the mechanics of data governance within the organization, what structures you build, what the authorities are, what the roles are, but also for the key persistent work that needs to be first built and then sustained and driven out. And that includes the business glossary, terms and definitions for shared data that everyone agrees with, and also metadata. What is, what are you going to collect? What is the knowledge management set of information about the data assets that you have? And in the area of data quality, the model has a four process area set of topics that comprise a 360 degree approach to data quality from strategy through cleansing. So we address data quality practices in some detail. In data operations, you're looking at establishing good, sound data requirements. We usually find that functional requirements are very well done, and data requirements are not really given the same level of attention, so that you have project teams, for example, designing the database at the last minute, right before technical design. Uh, so we're trying to help you prevent that. Also, we're looking at Interfaces and external data, how well is that managed? Does it have data quality? And we're also looking at data lineage, business process to data mapping, and designation of authoritative data source, sources within the organization. In platform and architecture, we're concentrating on uh, developing the target data architecture with the input of the business and reflecting the business strategy, the best practices for data integration, data standards of all kinds, uh, and also historical data, archiving, and record retention. So these are the five big buckets. And we also have five levels of capability. Now, it, it's come to my attention, and probably to many of your attentions, that every framework you see now has five levels of capability. That's because of our initial product, uh, CMMI for development, that's been out there for 25 years. And Peter's going to talk in detail about the history of that, how it developed, because he was there. So the five levels are basically level one is rudimentary capabilities performed ad hoc, project by project. And you don't really get much bang for the buck from them because they don't really go anywhere. It's just a good project manager on the IT side or an enlightened business sponsor. You can get some really good things done, but it's not shared, it's not promoted, and it isn't standardized. At level two, there's um, more robust capabilities in each of these topics, and also there is more sharing so that you'll see either an enterprise data warehouse or master data management project uh, implementing capabilities across a broader spectrum of shared data, or you will see one business line or another. For example, HR in Barrick Gold Corporation has done a phenomenal job managing their data. So has Vanguard HR. So those are some examples. So you'll see one business line really take the lead. At level three, it's the 85-15% rule. So you have basically developed standard processes, 
everybody knows about them, everyone is using them, and you're getting maximum efficiency and effectiveness from these data asset management processes. At level four, there's statistical analysis applied and metrics to the processes themselves so that you get even better. And at level five, there's continuous optimization and sharing with the industry because you become a star in the area. Speaking of stars, <laughs> <laughs> of course, everything is connected to everything else. But you're also going to talk a little bit about what's the origin for all of this. And there is supporting processes that are applied very, very well within the systems development life cycle. Things like metrics and management to metrics. Things like process quality assurance, making sure that the processes being performed are done correctly according to the standard. Things like process management, so making sure that your assets that support that process, like key artifacts, key templates, are managed and available to everyone who needs them. So these, these types of processes are practiced well, and they, and they don't really apply to data in most organizations. So the DMM, we're going to talk about it in some detail today. But essentially, it is a framework of best practices. It is architecture and technology neutral. So it's been applied at organizations that have huge mainframe applications, such as Freddie Mac's original servicing, loan servicing application, MIDAS, DB2 COBOL, uh, as well as organizations who are doing massive, uh, massive uh, contemporary initiatives for architectural transformation with the latest and the greatest technology, lots of big data, many BI tools, etc. It's also industry independent because for every industry, no matter what kind of data, even if the organization or the industry says, oh no, ours is unique. For, for instance, we've been working with the Health and Human Services Group on patient demographic data quality for record matching. And uh, when we look into the actual substance of the problem, it is a similar problem. No governance, uh, no metadata, you know, not a lot of business participation about the data assets and what to do with them. So we've applied this to many industries, and we'll give you examples of that. It's essentially, this framework, due to its detail as well as its structure, gives you a very quick answer about how you're doing now and very good guidelines for what should you do next. Because if you look at everything according to a set of best practices, it's very clear to you and everyone who participates where the gaps are. And usually the next steps fall out pretty quickly. So it's, it's a very good baseline for beginning to manage the data as a critical asset and to help you create a data management strategy. So you can put all of this into your mid to long term data management strategy and it will support what you're actually building, the architecture that you're building. It will definitely help you uh, accelerate an existing program. Uh, many organizations don't have a central data management function, for example, and this will help get that off the ground. It really engages stakeholders because it's written in business terms. That they can relate to it, and it also leads to a lot of enthusiasm and engagement. And as we said, it helps you pinpoint next steps and high value initiatives. And the reason we need to do that is because most people really just don't get data. And so I like to use the analogy of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which for some reason everybody remembers from high school. At the bottom level, if your food, clothing, and shelter needs are unmet, you will not advance to the safety level. You cannot be safe if you need food, clothing, and shelter. And of course, that leads us up to if you're not safe, you can't get to love and belonging, which gets to self-esteem and finally to the self-actualization piece. And the, the joke around that is that I can be self-actualized by getting home on the weekends and riding my horse a little bit and playing a little bit of music. So what does this have to do with data? Well, the advanced data practices that everybody's trying to do, what all the hype is around. And I've been using this chart for 30 years, and the only thing I've changed in, in there, the things inside the golden triangle, is that those pieces are functioning in exactly the same way as Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You can do them without trying to do the foundational levels, but it's very, very difficult, because those really do represent just the tip of the iceberg in terms of how your organizations are run. And that these foundational practices, as Melanie said, need to be the things that you build upon. Those pieces that we build upon there are really going to be foundational in nature, and that the things that are in the golden triangle are really just technological capabilities. And I'm not oversimplifying 
Every customer we've worked with has learned this lesson one way or another. There's another aspect of this that's critical to understand as well. And I'm showing on this particular example a weak link in data platform and architecture. That weak link means that the foundation of this data management practice can only be as strong as the weakest link in the chain. So we could put a lot of money effort into governance and quality, but if we don't fix the platform and architecture components, it won't help the organizational practices that are there. These are capabilities in nature as opposed to technologies. And at Data Blueprint, we always get the question, well, I don't care. I've got to have it done by Friday. Can you do it? And the answer is yes, we can do it without putting the foundation in peace, but it will take longer. It will cost more. It will deliver less, and it will present greater risk to the organization than if instead you learn how to do this properly. And then, Melanie, it gets us to this foundation for business results. So everyone wants certain things from the data. And you can abstract those by saying everyone wants trusted data. So, And what this framework will help you do is to have an independent demonstration of the capabilities that you are now implementing to enhance the uh, customer confidence in your data. Everyone wants to do a better job managing risk and to make incisive, sharp, uh, good business analytics decisions. And if you can, improve the data and the management thereof, you will be able to have much better results in analyzing risk and getting better quality from the analytics. We have a whole seminars on that, actually, how this ties to analytics. And of course, everyone is looking for cost reduction and operational efficiency. As we, I'll just choose my favorite example because I spent a long time uh, in enterprise architecture in my past. and. One of the things we despaired about in a federal agency that I was serving in was the number of point-to-point -point interfaces and the terribly high cost of integration testing of all those interfaces, release after release. <clears throat> there was one data warehouse that I recall that had over 100 incoming point-to-point -point interfaces and over 100 outgoing point-to-point -point interfaces. And you can imagine how much money and time was spent on testing and reconciling and so on. So we'd like to help you end that over time. For regulatory compliance, you need to be able to prove to the regulators, whoever they may be for your industry, that you are doing something to make better progress. And typically, many organizations have either their internal audit group or external auditors who give them findings. And the more of these findings uh, we have seen over the years, that relate to data, it's probably about 65 to 75% of audit findings relate directly or indirectly to data. So over on the right, we have the samsara to nirvana picture, where at the very bottom on the left, you can see the person being chased by the mad, angry elephant, and at the very top, the nirvana part, you can see that they're riding the elephant, meaning they've mastered their data layer, and it's all perfect harmony. So that's what we're after, and that's what this supports. <laughs> And the elephant existed long before Hadoop adopted it, too, right? That's right. <laughs> All right. So let's get to a little bit of motivation. And, and really, the, what this gets to is what Melanie said earlier on. If you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. So my favorite line from Alice in Wonderland. So we've noticed over the years that groups come to us and say, hey, we'd like to get our data management program up to the next level. Well, the first question is, what level are you at now? If you don't know, again, any path will take you there. But if you can't manage how you're doing it, Measure it, and then how do you expect to manage it effectively? So where do you put time and money into this? And we'll take you on just a brief origin of this. I had in the late 80s, early 90s, the title US Department of Defense Reverse Engineering Program Manager. And we sponsored research at Carnegie Mellon asking them specifically, how can we measure the performance of DOD and our partners that are working with us in the Defense Department? And they responded with the answer, you should go, first of all, check out and see what the Navy is up to. And that, I went down there, and it turned out John Zachman and Clive Finkelstein were doing some work for the Navy, which was really cool. And that's how I got into this whole uh, process in the first place. But the SEI responded with this integrated data and process improvement approach. And what was very interesting was that the DOD actually made them rip out the part of the data piece and said, your, your mission is software engineering. You shouldn't have anything to do with data. Uh, so it was literally lying around up at the SEI. Uh, with nothing else to do. And on one of my visits up there, um, 
they said, hey, you're a data guy. You're kind of crazy. Do you want this stuff? And it grew into this. Uh, there's an article out there you can look at in IEEE Computer where MITRE picked up some of the stuff and did an internal research and development project. And I put Burt Parker's picture up there. He's departed, but unfortunately, but uh, was very, very key in getting this through. Using this as understanding the approach. And it went, I think, a little bit. We did it. We did surveys of hundreds of organizations. But now what we've done is, is that it has evolved back to the SEI where it should have. And then from there, through the CMMI Institute, and now you guys are actually a part of ISACA, right, Melanie? We are. We're proud uh, children of ISACA, 140,000 member organization. So now we are looking at their products, such as COVID and their cybersecurity areas, and we're looking at joint products. So we're very happy to uh, be owned by a very fine organization that agrees with us in, in strategy and its offerings. We think and it's we, a superb pairing, right? <laughs> yes, it's very good. So we still have training and certification programs, and we'll talk about that later for the DMM. So the CMMI development model, which many of you are familiar with, almost every organization has encountered it in some way or another, uh, was the Software Engineering Institute's uh, probably most successful product that they ever came up with other than the ones they can't tell us about because now they're working on uh, deep cyber. But this has been used and benefited more than 10,000 organizations. And it's used in 94 countries, and you can say that national governments have adopted it and translated. We have lots and lots of partners conducting appraisals against it. And also, there were almost you know, close to 2,000 appraisals done worldwide in 2016. And the areas of greatest growth now are China, uh, India, and South America. Fantastic. The other reason that we say this is really critical for everybody to adopt this framework is because your boss has seen this before. So even if you aren't, your boss isn't an IT person, they have looked at process improvement in a way that they can uh, look at this and say, oh, that's just CMM for data management. And if they get that piece of it, they mostly go, oh, that's worked in other areas. Sure, absolutely, it's what we should do here as well. I mentioned the scientific rigor. There are lots of good assessments, and there is nothing wrong with any of them, but they only give you one data point. This process of improvement has been studied and compared against things like ITEL, RUP, COBIT, and PMI. Uh, RUP, by the way, is the object-oriented paradigm, the agile movement, if you will. And it shows here that it gives you better ability to deliver your projects on budget and on time than these other opportunities do. So it's a very, very strong grounding in the science. And when somebody comes at you with something that is not grounded in science, it's a good idea to ask them, why aren't you using the one that has a good scientific track record? Sorry, Melly, and I didn't queue so up for that one. There you go. <laughs> yes, these are, the mo these are the models that we currently support, as well as the DMM, which we're about to launch into. Uh, again, we're just sort of showing that for you for take a look at it. We're also collaborating with DEMA International to eliminate the confusion between the tools. We think there's great synergy there, and we're looking to uh, help people uh, do that. And if people want to volunteer in that, that would be a great opportunity as well. So let's talk about what is in the data management maturity model. This is the book, right, Melanie? This is the book. So it's approximately 270 pages. I call it bedtime reading because it will shorten your time to slumber if you just look at it, since it is rather uh, comprehensive and quite dense. And we'll talk about how it comes alive a little later. But it is a reference model. It took a long time to develop. It was released August 2014. And our key sponsors for this were Microsoft, Lockheed Martin, and Booz Allen Hamilton, who invested time, treasure, and talent to help us write this. We had over 50 contributing authors, all of whom had lots and lots of experience implementing, designing programs, learning from failures, and learning from successes. We had 70 peer reviewers. One of them is on the phone here, Mr. Peter Aiken and uh, many people that are really luminaries in their field, uh, such as Peter Chen, inventor of uh, entity relationship modeling, Bill Inman, father of data warehousing, uh, many other people who have had lifetimes of experience packed into their career. And overall, 80 organizations were involved. And we got 1,200 comments when we put it out for peer review. 
and many of which were addressed, and some of which were, you should handle data security, and we said, next version. <laughs> but really, really good input from our industry. Uh, so we have lots of specific practice statements, and they're organized by process areas. We'll show you in a moment. And many, many functional work products. These are artifacts, uh, templates, things that are typically produced when you're doing the activities. And uh, let's move to the next slide. So this, is, this model emphasizes action and behavior. So we're not talking about theory in the model. It's all, all these practices are things that uh, very robust organizations are doing and have done for decades. We are not state of the art. We're state of the practice, but the best state of the practice. So the model is trying to get organizations to be able to make proactive, positive behavioral changes. And also, as we said, for level three, having effective, repeatable processes for reuse. And this, these are to be leveraged and extended across the organization. So it's really a cultural change. And in fact, the, or the idea of change management is operative here. If you want to change your culture, you really have to prepare people, educate them, and bring them all along a, a step at a time. And uh, Peter, I know you can, you can agree with this. Everyone from the data entry clerk intern for the summer to the CEO has a role in managing the data assets. So unlike uh, our other model, CMMI development, this one is very broad in its reach. So there is quite a lot of work to do. And through the model, you can help see what everybody's role should be. And then, of course, these, this is all shown in work products. And this allows you to gain the maximum value from the data assets, to build the right data assets, to integrate them properly, et cetera. Everything in it is practical. If it didn't pass the sniff test, the gauntlet of all objections from the other authors, it didn't get in here. We had to give lots of implementation examples to, give it, to get any sentence in this model. Again, real world focus is, is really key to that. And your metaphor of everybody rowing in the same direction is perfect for that. So Melanie's already done this. I'm just going to do it very quickly. You get one point if you have a pulse. And that's a very low standard. Uh, then we try to get it up to the next level to say what is defined and documented managed process. Then really use standardly and consistently across the enterprise. If you don't measure it, how are you going to do anything with it? And then optimized. And this the basis for this level process has been the basis for TQM, ISO 9000, all sorts of other movements. So beyond anything that, that CMMI has done, there's also lots of good other things in those areas that prove it, and tons and tons of academic research. Uh, and again, Melanie, you're going to talk now about specifically what that means when people are using this. So we always get this question, what is the difference between capability and maturity? So this, the purpose of this is to, to quickly disambiguate it. Essentially, capability is the ability to carry out activities. So the specific practices in the model, if you're doing them, then you are demonstrating a capability. And the work products also demonstrate that you've documented what you're doing so that you can extend it and get maximum value from it. Whereas we, it, from the CMMI development point of view, as well as from the DMM's point of view, maturity is beyond capability. It's, it is um, a hand in glove or a nice horse and carriage with capability. It shows that what you have established is now stable and it's resilient. So under times of stress, for example, the financial crash of 2008, you want the processes to still work so that you don't lose effectiveness and efficiency. It helps you have repeatable processes. And these are just sensible things, like having a policy, offering training, doing quality assurance, et cetera. So support the processes. As you go up through the levels, you know, the quality goes up, <clears throat> reusability goes up. And I want to make the one more point that your staff is, your staff is more clear and happy. And they don't have to reinvent the wheel project by project. And actually, you didn't say stress at the bottom there, too, which is that a lot of organizations say thank you for putting this in place because we kind of weren't sure exactly where we were going. Yeah, the overall effect of using this model, I have to say, is uh, sobering because you're saying, oh, shoot, we didn't pay attention to that because we were busy on this. Uh, so it's a little sobering, but mostly I would say relief is the main word when all of this comes out into the open. It's like in the matrix taking the red pill. You want to see the truth. 
<laughs> so that you can improve the reality. Okay. So when you're evaluating against the model, there's a lot of content in the model. And with our with our 2.0 release that we'll start on uh, at the end of the year, we will put more content, more helpful tips in the model. But it's pretty big already. The only things that, that are scored are the functional practices for capability and the support practices I mentioned for maturity. Everything else is supporting that. And what that does, and we showed you this before, we'll just make sure that you get the idea, though. And we're, we're getting so thankful as an industry that, that CMMI did this particular work. But Melanie gave you the simple version of this before. What I'm going to do is lay on a couple of, of pieces on the top here, which is to say that your data management strategy is taking the organization from its current work group based focus and move it to an enterprise focus so that you're managing data coherently, that you have a professional class of individuals who have knowledge, skills, and abilities, certification, and training to be able to do these jobs. There's a lot of people that can put titles on their resumes or their LinkedIn profiles. That doesn't mean they know how to do it. There is a process by which you can become certified on this. That you understand that data quality is not an absolute thing, but that you're trying to get the data that is not rot, that is not redundant, obsolete, or trivial, to be effective and efficient making the purpose of what you're trying to do. That you do it with the right technologies and the right processes. And if you don't, you're going to spend more encounter greater risk, take longer, and cost more all the way around. So those are the five areas in a little bit more detail. Melanie, you're going to talk specifically about each one, although I guess just briefly as far as we go through these, right? Yes. OK, so data management strategy. This is to enable you to plan and manage your data assets as a critical component of infrastructure. And by way of illustrating that, I can just say this. That, we, that data management needs to be considered as a permanent lifetime function of an organization, just like facilities management, finance, and human resources. You, your whole mission depends on your data. You've created the data since the day your, your organization began, and you'll have data forever. So it's a forever function. And this helps you hone in on an organization-wide approach to manage this critical asset. Governance has a lot of functions. That when we talk about governance, and even the way some people define governance, it is very, it is very stick-oriented versus carrot-oriented. And the DMM takes both sides of that. In other words, yes, compliance is very important. Compliance processes are important. And enforcing standards are important. But more important is the engagement of individuals in doing tasks to manage the data assets well and help build the, the right data layer. So it's more, of a, um, it's more of a building and nurturing function on the front end, sustaining it through decisions on access, decisions on meaning, decisions on uh, prospective designs, and then controlling. So we like to emphasize both sides of that. Uh, and that's true. You need the staff expertise for the permanent products like the business glossary and metadata. One word on the business glossary is that it is essentially any differentiation between meaning is essentially a business problem. For example, at one global insurance company, uh, some executives told us that they could not aggregate uh, their revenues very well because they were not using the word program and product identically across the rather distributed business areas of the, of the corporation. So, and for uh, both Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, they both told us that it took them several years to completely parse out loan-to-value ratio. So these are key business concepts. And if there's a lot of divergence and differentiation, there's a problem. It's a business problem. That's why you need people to work together happily. Okay. I cut you off on that last one. Sorry about That's that. Fine. Go ahead. That's all right. So data quality, you need to know the terrain, so you need to have a strategy. Everyone complains about the quality of their data. It's not available enough. It's not accurate enough. It doesn't agree. Uh, it's never been cleaned up. I have to clean the same data every month. So these are common complaints. And if you're the CIO or the COO or anyone dealing with data at a macro level, then you hear these complaints all the time. So logically speaking, and you can use any of these process areas, which, are, which have a lot of content in the DMM, you can use any of them separately. The entire DMM is like that. You can use it by category, the whole model, one process area that you're concentrating on. These have rather a logical structure. So the first is to think about what do we want to do about data quality? Often, as Peter can tell you probably from hundreds of projects, it's just 
varied in one project versus another project. So how do we want to handle it as an organization? This is what our COO and all of the COO's business lines are demanding, good quality data. Strategy addresses that. Profiling addresses the discovery of known and unknown defects and anomalies in data sets. And uh, we have the model talks about practices for determining what needs to be profiled, how often to profile it, what are the triggering events that should uh, institute profiling. Data quality assessment is essentially a view, which is business driven, of how you're going to tackle the data, what, how, what is fit, fitness for purpose in a given context, what thresholds of quality can you accept, and what targets are you aiming at. I can give you a specific example. For the Pension Benefits Guarantee Corporation, when they took over a pension plan, they had to have 95% of the current and future beneficiaries identified before they could start paying the guaranteed benefit. So sometimes there are hard thresholds, and this is the kind of thing this process area talks about, deciding what that is. And of course, data cleansing and improvement. I had one CTO tell me, I hate data quality, and what he meant was, he was spending again and again and again on cleansing. There was a large corporation, an IT corporation, that had a complete organization. All they did was clean, clean data all day long. And uh, the problem with that was uh, they spent millions and millions every month cleaning the same data because they didn't have the ability to cause changes in the source. So the DMM is very strong to help you with your data quality program. Operations, I talked about requirements already. You do a beautiful job. Almost every organization I have been to in my entire career does a great job with functional requirements, screen requirements, etc. Not a good job with data requirements. Uh, and quick example, it took me a couple of years at one federal agency to get uh, the project teams to submit the logical data model and the functional requirements at the same time so enterprise architecture could, could make sure that they were in agreement. So that, you know, it's, it's been tough on the data side. Uh, so we talked about business process to, to data mapping. You don't need to do this for every single business process, but for the critical business processes that are uh, important to your mission, uh, you should know where the data is being created, where it's being updated, and who has authority over it. Um, and data lineage is very, very important, especially for regulatory purposes. Which source did it come from? What is the provenance of the source? Which source should take precedence if the sources disagree, et cetera? And managing your providers. Uh, several large financial organizations that we've been to in the last couple of years have had massive procurement projects, uh, programs, to try to get a better handle on the data coming in from outside the organization. Uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission, for example, uh, told us that they bought the same source two and three times, depending on the business area. So good practices to straighten that out. And platform. So what, what the model does not do in any way, because it is not prescriptive, it does not tell you what to build, but it does tell you what are the good practices to use when you're designing the target architecture and, and uh, managing the transition to it. So one enterprise architecture team, a really sterling team with highly skilled people, came up with a complete target data architecture for an organization, and the chief architect told us the business hated it, and they didn't even look at it because they had not been involved. So we want to help you not run into that problem. Architectural standards, everyone needs them. They will help you clean up, streamline, organize, and uh, and lower the cost of the data layer over time, as well as for access, as well as for security. The platform is making sure that the business lines are engaged when you're choosing technology. Uh, another financial organization was choosing a big data technology, and a lot of their users were actually very technologically savvy. So they had made this purchase decision, and then it turned out that there were there were key features that weren't being met. So they came, you know, it was a very a uh, big conflict at a pretty high level of the organization. So if you follow these practices, you won't make that decision. You know, it will be good. And of course, best practices for data integration and as well as historical data, data archiving and uh, records retention, very important. Melanie, I'm going to jump you right ahead to supporting processes also there. Mm -hmm. So these are the ones that are usually 
done fairly well on the development side for software, but not done well with data. So this is basically good housekeeping practices. And I won't talk about them, because I already kind of mentioned what they were. Very good. Thanks, Melanie. And we know that there's a number of you that are concerned from access and privacy types of issues, too. So just a, a brief review, just a, a way of categorizing these things. If you're in that business, you're interested in what we call the four A's, which is authentication, which is to validate that users are, in fact, who they say they are supposed to be. Uh, it's a very important task. Then authorization is to make sure that they have access to the things that they should have and don't have access to the things that they shouldn't have. Excuse me, authorization. Then, of course, access, which makes sure that facilitates it. And then we, of course, want an audit function that comes back on that as well. And I hope that you see from what we've presented so far that each of those four practices will probably show up in one form or another at some point when somebody says, hey, data security could benefit from this approach as well. And the goal with all of that is to try and take what's happening in information security and modeling and try to move it from a reactive type of discipline, which is like, oh my gosh, what just happened, to what we see in most organizations, which is really a compliance-driven model, so I'm doing it because somebody's telling me to do it, as opposed to a risk-based model, which allows us to get really out in front of these things. Because if you're always fighting fires because your practices are not good in the first place, then it's very unlikely you will be able to have really proactive approaches around that. We may get some questions on that, but let's, uh, let's keep pressing on here. And with that, what I want to do is introduce our guest here. Jeff is a, uh, a person who I jokingly said at the beginning, going to solve all the state of Arizona's data problems. Um, but realistically, that is what he's trying to take on. Uh, the state has made a very strong commitment to uh, improving the way state government is delivered in the state, and that there's some very exciting work there that both Melanie and I have been involved in. But really, Jeff is the person who has led this. So Jeff, I'll turn it over to you for a little bit. Thanks, Peter. I appreciate that. <clears throat> so as Melanie mentioned, the DMM, one of the roles of it is to support organizational change. And uh, we've been, uh, the exercise that we're trying to do here is an organizational change, and I'm trying to do it from the point of view of the uh, Department of Administration, which is an apex agency in the state of Arizona. And I work in the Arizona Strategic Enterprise Technology Office, which is essentially the IT department for the state, and is a very federated state. So we have over 100 agencies that do their own thing. Trying to get things to happen at this level is difficult. We don't have uh, the, the force of a legislation or an executive order, but what we do have is policies, and that's something that we do control here in this, in this agency. So we've leveraged the DMM in, in some ways to strengthen our policies. Uh, one thing we've found is that when we quote or use a widely accepted framework in our policies, they are less likely to be questioned and challenged. So for example, our security policies all reference NIST controls. When I first drafted our state data governance policies, there wasn't a, a DMM framework at that point and there was a lot of pushback. After the DMM came out, I started to insert references to it in our policies, and you can see an example there on the slide. Uh, and the pushback actually turned into, tell me more. I want to learn more about this DMM. It was a very interesting transition. And that's helped us move towards adopting the DMM and getting more visibility into it. Can't get and much more real world than that, right? <laughs> yeah. We control what we can. You bet. So Arizona's governor, Doug Ducey, is um, he's building a strategy based on what we call the Arizona management system. It's very strong on metrics, lean, and process improvements. And five concepts, there's five core concepts that drive the strategy. Decide faster, resolve faster, respond faster, put more services online, and reduce cost by improving efficiency. I'd never hesitate to tell anyone that I meet how important good data is to all of those. And a strong methodology is key to having good data. Uh, we chose to adopt DMM because it provides a methodology to measure maturity in multiple process areas and a way to track it. 
And we also emphasize enterprise architecture in Arizona. And the methodology fits that very well because it allows you to measure the as-is state with a baseline analysis, um, identify gaps, and create a roadmap to close the gaps. Next slide. I first heard about the DMM from a presentation that uh, Melanie and Peter gave, I think back in 2015. Um, in in uh, January 2016, we put on a two-day data management uh, conference. That really helped kickstart our program. Peter came out with Mitch Hamilton from his from Data Blueprint and uh, led that two-day conference. And initially, that conference was supposed to be data governance training. We had a small budget to manage training. And when I told people I wanted to do data governance training, they literally yawned. So I morphed that into data management training, and then it became data management conference. And people started to pay attention at that point. So where we are today is um, I engaged our communications team to help me get the right people into that conference and uh, engineered an executive briefing on the second day. Communication and getting the right people in the room and agency leadership is key to getting your program going. And uh, the DMM could be part of that, but before you even get there, you have to get the right people in the room. Uh, we got our governor's chief of operations, Henry Darwin, to send out an email to the cabinet agencies telling them how important this conference is, and we filled the room. Uh, that's where we introduced the DMM. And I had people come to me after that meeting to say they were completely on board, and many were genuinely excited about setting a goal to reach maturity level three. And that's the goal we're working towards as and it's stated that way in our program charter. Uh, this month, we held CMMI's Building Enterprise Data Management Capabilities Training. We had 20 people participate from 11 agencies. Again, there was a great deal of effort spent on making sure we got the right people in the room. And we had great success, great feedback from that. And we have six of those people who have already asked for advanced training. I approach training a little differently than we used to. Um, we used to have, we, we always had a modest training budget, but holding the training events was more a, a matter of checking off a box, you know, training done, what's next? Uh, but when you're trying to drive organizational change, training is an opportunity to build a team. You have an opportunity to communicate ideas and share plans and develop strategy with people who, by their very presence in the room, are really interested in your subject. So if you make sure that you get the right people in there, make them feel empowered and part of a team, and they'll take advantage of what they learn and bring it back to their agencies to drive change. So the DMM gives us a very good framework to help us do that. Um, next slide. For next steps, um, our data management program is gaining broader visibility across the agencies. We had uh, 11 agencies in that um, training. Some of our students want to help other agencies with their data management projects, so we're talking about setting up a sort of um, a SWAT team, to a DMM SWAT team to build momentum and extend the program. And we're planning to do BDMM baseline assessments for three to four agencies coming up here soon. And interestingly, just yesterday, the governor's chief of staff asked our CIO for our data strategy. Uh, interestingly enough, um, data strategy is one of the DMM practice areas, process areas. And so we're going to be working on that and presenting that to the chief of staff, which is going to help get this program really off the ground. And uh, we're holding another conference coming up here in, uh, in April. Hopefully, I'll come back here in another meeting and be able to present more progress and keep you up to date.
Oh, gosh, Jeff, we'd sure like that. I, I'll tell you a little trick that uh, a friend of ours uh, pulled for one of the other states. Uh, he went up and looked up in the statute uh, to see who owned the data of the state. And usually, the way most states have their uh, constitutions written, it's the governor. And so when you go to the governor of the state and say, do you know that you are personally and directly responsible for all of this stuff that's going on out here? They will almost always say, oh, we'd better put a program around that because I'm probably not the best person to be in charge of it. But if statutory, that's the way it works, it can be an important uh, mover to get you moving on things. As well as to help get funding, which everyone needs. <laughs> Everybody them. needs. And Jeff's been very so fortunate. In, I, I will just there. say about Arizona that um, having been uh, involved in that training in Arizona, that Jeff not only got a great group of people there who are now, as he's pointed out, seed enthusiasts in their varying agencies, uh, but they, they also were all very happy to hear about data being presented from all of the facets of uh, foundational practices because each of them had been involved in certain topic areas due to the programs they were involved in. And, uh, it's very helpful to have all the light bulbs go off and give people a sort of an elevated, more enterprise perspective of the data. And I'll, I'll lend my voice there too, Jeff. You did recognize that getting people together was a key aspect of this. And you had some teams that clearly were formed at that first uh, session that have now developed into cross-agency cooperation, which is something almost every governor is, is majorly enthusiastic about. So hats off to you. It's a, it's a good project. Thank you. We have Actually, about 25 I, agencies now participating in our steering committee. Super. And I, I use the word badly there. It's the good program. I, I, I'm the one that's yelling about people. This is not a project. It's a program. So shame <laughs> on me for doing that incorrectly. But again, thank you, Jeff, for that. So as we're, we're working towards this, again, it, Eric said we're going to go a little long here today. Um, once you have these components, and I, I'm not going to go through these components again because you've seen them three times already, but you can now start to look and see what's happening. So here's an assessment that I did for the insurance industry, which simply showed them that they have some work to do. And we can look at it very specifically and in a detailed format for an individual organization. This is an airline that we were doing some work for. And I, I'm showing them these charts, and they're saying to themselves, a one, one, two twos, and a one, what do I care? And the answer is, well, here's your competition. And they go, oh, we're the ones and they're twos. That's bad, right? And then the other part of this, and Melanie's going to get a little bit more into it is where do we go next? And as I mentioned before, if you don't take the ones and make them twos, there's no point in trying to take any of the twos and make them into threes. So this is the weak link in the chain in order to understand this. One more piece of this, which is that you're going to find, notice I didn't tell you which airline and which insurance company. Those are confidential pieces of information. But the World Bank told us we could use their numbers here. They asked us to do their treasury function, their information systems group, and the bank business process itself. Their treasury was a flat one. Their information systems group were ones as well. But the finance corporation, the business itself, actually had world-class best practices. And when you add the rest of this stuff in, here, what you notice is that this organization just needs to walk down the hall to find out what these best practices were. And that's the, likely the answer in many of your agencies around the country here is that you probably have pockets of this. And so you can use these exercises like Jeff did to surface these pockets and really help us to um, you know, identify internal best practices that then you can leverage across the rest of the state. So it's a, a very much of a, there are probably some really good people in your area doing this. That's great. If we step back, however, and look at the overall assessments, and these are the measurements I took between 07 and 12, the only thing you'll notice here is that they are statistically unchanged. And that's a problem. So we've got a lot more that's been going on, but we're not getting better about how we're approaching it. This is probably the best argument for going into this. Melanie, we'll go back over to your uh, next piece here. Yes, yeah, so to help you get traction so that you don't spin your wheels, as Peter's last chart uh, just illustrated, uh, we have a method for using this model with the, in the shortest possible time with the highest amount of participation possible, which is, uh, delivers very quick results. And this is our assessment method, which we teach, train, and certify against and also use with the organizations we visit. So we put a lot of stakeholders together, approximately 60 to 65 percent business data experts uh, at the managerial or director level and also the key IT program individuals and maybe possibly someone from enterprise architecture, someone from business architecture if you have 
uh, that function implemented, and even occasionally people from internal audit or risk management. So uh, stakeholders are all together. There are four three-hour workshops that navigate the entire content of the DMM. So this is by consensus. It is a, it is a facilitated self-assessment against these very specific practices. We do supplemental interviews with key personnel who are managing large programs to get additional business context, looking at all the work products that the organization is able to collect for us to review, and write a report, which is usually, it gets, it's getting longer every time. It's usually around, around 60 to 70 pages of uh, scoring, findings, observations, business context, and uh, initiative recommendations that uh, take you based on who you are, where your gaps are, where you want to go, these are the projects you should do right away for the maximum value. So um, this is a useful method, and it helps put a manageable time limit on this uh, very intense content. Next slide, please. And at the end of the workshops, you already know how you're doing. So this is the one-page chart that summarizes everything by process area, how did you score? And it's, it's supplemented by the detailed spreadsheet that evaluates and weights and comes up with the raw score and a rounded score to the nearest quarter point. Where level three there is the white line, and that is where we think everyone should aim. This particular picture is not a real organization, but it's close to a real organization. And it shows that they spent a lot of time and attention, in their case, on metrics and on the data quality strategy and planning. And that other areas, for example, uh, their process quality assurance feature and uh, some of the data cleansing, they didn't spend a lot of time on. So, you know, it's a broad set of topics and you can't do everything. So this shows you where you are and where you need to build. Next slide, please. Uh, and we've had, you know, probably the benefits of using this model are 50% the knowledge, the precision, and the technical evaluation piece. And 50% of the benefits of this are increased engagement, increased effort, uh, and a lot of enthusiasm on the part of the participants because they're looking at this, they're building the forest from the trees statement by statement. And in, in return, they're getting a great deal of perspective and they are sharing both issues and successes with each other. They're discovering things. Like we were at uh, Scotiabank um, and they were the risk people in non-credit risk had done some really great things and had some great artifacts. And the other areas of risk said, oh, this is great. Can we use this? And of course, the answer was yes. So it, it creates a lot of synergy. And speaking of using it, again, as you're diving into whether it's a regulatory or specific security need, all of these things can be done in the same fashion. And uh, without giving up too much away, there's likely to be some interesting developments in that area coming up here. But when we're looking at things for defining standards, the same model applies very, very nicely. And in fact, we have seen several organizations come up with it on their own. Uh, Melanie, you've had a lot of different people that have worked in this so far. Yes. So these are some examples. Uh, it, sometimes uh, our first, our first um, engagement with the DMM was with the developing model in October 2011. We walked in to talk to the chief operating officer of the Securities and Exchange Commission in Washington. And uh, he was very familiar with CMMI dev. So Peter's example that it's easy to sell because they know CMMI, uh, he had used this at Citibank uh, previously. And he said, oh, this is a CMMI for data. I need it. So that, that, that took about two sentences for him to uh, do it. And uh, they, they approved the results, and they are still using that today, the report. So Microsoft needed to um, have information management uh, improved because they were going to transition to the real-time enterprise. So that was their underlying driver for doing this. Fannie Mae had a very strong EDM program. They needed validation for it and to refresh their strategy with new initiatives. The Federal Reserve System statistics function across the 12 banks wanted to leverage their capabilities, which were extensive, they're really stars, across all of the banks. So they wanted more visibility as well as to make tweaks to improve their program even further. Vanguard had an enterprise data governance capability that's truly robust, and they wanted to extend enterprise of views of all of these other topics to implement shared services across their domains. The American Board of Family Medicine 
needed to improve the data quality around their exam questions for physician licensing. And in their case, there was a possibility that their function could be outsourced to another group. So they also had a competitive advantage reason for doing this. Freddie Mac had to uh, get a data management program together for its single family business because that was one of the two audit findings. And they immediately took these recommendations. And a year later, they did a case study showcasing the amazing progress they'd made building governance, implementing co uh, quality, et cetera. And uh, Barrett Gold Corporation, that we've just finished an assessment for, headquartered in Toronto with nine big mines around the world, <coughs> they needed to prepare for their huge digitization effort, which includes sensor-to-sensor uh, -sensor data, as well as to uh, upgrade their te technical capabilities, including big data and unstructured data, and significantly boosting their analytics capabilities. So they needed to make sure that as Peter's Triangle, they're the perfect Peter's Triangle slide. They wanted to make sure that their advanced capabilities would have a shot at being very successful right out of the gate because they were going to upgrade the supporting practices that make them succeed. So every organization has their own strategic business drivers. And when the assessment is complete, as I said, a lot of the projects fall out like ripe fruit pretty easily. This is an actual set of processes and projects that we came up with for the Securities and Exchange Commission to be implemented by the Chief Data Officer. So a lot of little projects with dependencies. And uh, let's go to the next slide. So this one is really about sneaking this in through the back door. Uh, we have something in Virginia called the Governor's Data Interns Program. And just as Jeff has had a lot of people saying, what's going on over there in Arizona from this perspective, uh, we're getting a lot of interest in Virginia here as well. This is the uh, fourth year of the program. And what we're doing here is actually telling students about this. And they're going into the agencies and saying to them, wouldn't you like to get a bit better organized around the whole process? Uh, there's a lot more on this. I'm not going to bore you with the details, but just to show you that you can do it from the top down as well as from the bottom up and achieve some really interesting results. So this is a cumulative benchmark. And these are all the organizations either that we've worked with or our students and partners have worked with. And so that is a, those blue bars are the ranges of anyone who scored anywhere on that, that range. So the very high bars, um, a lot of them are from the Federal Reserve System and then Fannie Mae, who now has probably uh, close to a world-class data management program. To get there, they've been at this for 20 years. They were an early adopter of data warehousing technology, and uh, they, they were known around the Beltway here as you know, a premier technological organization. So they had a huge implemented base. And now what they're doing, I just want to highlight this one example because it's really spiffy. They, have, um, in a, they are replacing their entire enterprise data warehouse layer through agile delivery, completely harmonized and synergized with their data management program. So all of their designs, all of their processes are in a very smooth, nested flow. And they're delivering on time and on budget, uh, this ma massive uh, transformation effort. So if you look at this slide, you can see that certain areas are are strong and certain areas are weak. Like most organizations have tackled governance. So if you look at the uh, sixth bar to the right from the beginning of the chart, you can see that mostly organizations have done a fairly good job with governance. Whereas on, on life cycle management and uh, measurements, metrics, they're not doing so well. So they're below the program level, which means that when, when we were assessing them, they couldn't even find one business line or one shared data type program that was up to snuff in terms of the processes. So you can see it's quite uneven, and, the, and each your organization is truly unique. And Melanie, I'll contrast this with the chart I showed you all earlier, which has the overall 07 to 12 statistics in those areas. Those are organizations that have not tried this. And so the amount of you know, sort of before and after pictures here are just absolutely striking. Mm -hmm. So this illustrates uh, Microsoft's uh, conclusion towards its data management strategy following the assessment. So you see how they've organized this and how they, they, they set up a big data governance 
Committee, which a few years later now is in full form and charging around the entire organization, is well recognized. Uh, they did some redesigns based on this and improved their data quality operations significantly. Uh, let's go to the next slide. They, and they, these were the main categories of recommendations that they were going to implement in uh, the area of doing a strategy, uh, approaching their primary shared data assets differently, uh, changing their uh, retention strategy, and integrating governance. And essentially, notice the first bullet in the world of devices and services, because of course uh, machine learning is extremely big at Microsoft, and sensor to sensor communications and preparing the groundwork for that in their product suite. So they've recognized that data management is critical for the success of this contemporary new uh, technology, and also to improve the ability of the organization to do near real-time and real-time analytics. And uh, the bottom bullet, build on strength. So the DMM essentially takes a very positive view. Basically, wherever you are, there you are. And here is a built-in abstracted improvement path for capabilities for your organization. Um, and we offer a complete training package. So uh, Jeff just mentioned that we did a three-day class uh, at, the, at the Arizona State uh, Government Headquarters with these different agencies. So we will do this class on site. We also have an e-learning version of the class, but it's much more fun in person because there's many, many team exercises built in. We have a five-day class that allows people to really uh, sharpen up their consulting skills in terms of designing and implementing data management programs and projects. And then our expert certification, which is a five-day class uh, in preparation for our uh, senior certification, which basically means that after that class, you not only have mastered the model as a reference model and a tool, but that you are also confident that you can go to any organization in any industry and give them an incisive report on their gaps, strengths, and next steps. And we will be unveiling a, another certification shortly. So we, I think we've addressed this part, Peter. Uh, we have a partner program that we have uh, got a, a number of individuals, uh, individual companies involved, and we're adding partners all the time. And Data Blueprint was our very first partner. So you can see Peter and I have been at this for a while. So um, old buds, exactly. Yeah, old buds. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay. All right, so we've taken you here in an hour and 15 minutes through a, a fairly good amount of information. What questions can we now put back to you all? And again, there's three of us online here that we want to talk about specifically uh, for, for helping out. So please, any questions, Melanie, Jeff, or myself, or of course to Eric as well. So we've got the chat open. Please uh, submit your questions through the chat. Uh, and I'll start a question out here to Melanie. The certification that you have, uh, is that certification actually uh, sort of the end product of taking the course, or is it more like the PMI model where, or even Six Sigma, where you're actually doing a project, and part of certification is not only the training, but you have a live project that you've been working through as you go through the training? Yes, graduating from if you if you want to you know take our entire series of training, um, graduating from the Enterprise Data Management Expert course uh, is the clearance bar for doing a, a, an, a live engagement with an observation, which is essentially one of us accompanies you, helps you prepare the client organization, observes the workshops and interviews, gives you as much mentoring and helpful assistance as possible. And then we review the report and the briefing uh, to help you uh, do this. And I have to say that uh, of our graduated EDMEs who have been working with organizations, uh, we're very proud that every single one of them did a great job their first time out and that they were very happy because it worked as advertised and their clients were overjoyed. So, for example, the CEO of the American Board of Family Medicine that one of our EDMEs uh, did as his first engagement uh, the CEO said on day two, I've already gotten much more value out of this than I thought. 
So it was good. Wonderful. So our, okay. our students are happy. <laughs> As we're, as we're still waiting for a few questions, we're going to close in a little bit here, folks, but we did want to open it up for questions uh, if you have any now. And if you think of things after we close this webinar, you can respond to Peter, Melanie, or Jeff. Here's their contact information. And, Someone is typing. Uh, oh, good. All right. Someone's typing. Good. So we'll, uh, we'll uh, address any questions even after the close of this. Uh, have you thought about recertification, Melanie? So to maintain certification, what's required? Uh, we have essentially a, a point system, which is very similar to continuing education uh, credits. And that, that involves doing a certain number of engagements over a five-year period. I think we have a minimum of two. We also have uh, white papers, conferences, webinars, and basically just demonstrating that you're adding to the data management profession. As, as you continue to collect those professional development points, uh, are those, uh, you know, because we've got so many people that have multiple certifications, how mm -hmm. much crossover could there be, for instance, someone maintaining PMI certification or folks like myself with a certified government CIO certification? Uh, is there a crossover? So there may not be something. We that's a very good that's a very good uh, point, and uh, we could actually we probably will be working on uh, cross certification with ISACA going forward. Here's our question: Could you elaborate more on the huge cost of point-to-point -point interfaces? <laughs> uh, who would like to take that one? Peter, go oh, ahead. Well. I was going to say, let's give it to Jeff because he's been managing yeah, that stuff. But you know, actually, imagine the three of us trying to answer your question at once. That's actually a lot like point to point because it's very hard to do this sort of stuff. So, Jeff, do you want to take a crack at it? Well, one of the issues that we have here is um, around sharing data. We have a lot of manual exchanges. We have a lot of uh, agencies exchanging data with a specific agency. Um, and each one of those exchanges is a specific format, a specific spec, and the specific connection criteria and all that kind of stuff. By sharing that through a hub, uh, you're able to save costs, create one interface instead of many, and have multiple people or multiple agencies subscribe to it. So that, that creates more of a sharing hub rather than creating all these point-to-point -point connections. And again, if you think about it, the complexity of connecting everything to everything else goes up by an exponential curve. Uh, so if you have 100 uh, you know, places, you're trying to connect to 100 places, it's just a lot of work. Death by a thousand cuts is what we call it. Whereas if you take and integrate everything with a spoken hub system, it's not that things become easy, but you do anything to get to easier. And that's really what our goals are. Right, so the target data architecture that you should be engaged in at all times, you should be working towards your, your vision of the future data layer, the target data architecture will eventually become more streamlined, more simplified. And essentially, I think we, I, I would say all of us here subscribe to the, uh, the Inman axiom, which is that the data stores themselves should not have tons of embedded logic. It's best that all of that intelligence and business rules and quality rules are applied in the ETL layer outside of the data store itself, which should be, whether structured or unstructured, beautifully organized and clean. 100% agreement. OK, and we don't have any more questions at this point. Well, <clears throat> Melanie, Jeff, and Peter, thank you so much for presenting to us uh, this afternoon. and. We're going to have you all back uh, as things progress in Arizona and then other stories as well coming from uh, state and local government. Uh, but this has uh, been extremely informative. This is not for the faint of heart. This is absolutely uh, essential data management, pragmatic training, and uh, we really appreciate you all being here. Uh, thank especially Thank to you. Jeff for telling specific stories here on this because uh, Melanie and I are both under NDAs and can only say certain things, right? Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Good to see Great, you, Jeff. Great, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Sure. It was a pleasure.
Very good. And uh, thank you all for participating. Stay tuned for future webinars coming from uh, NASIO on the subject of data management. If you've got other comments, questions, please respond to me or the speakers. And we uh, look forward to seeing you on future events. Have a great afternoon.